I've pulled up FOIA machine here. Quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of or used FOIA machine? Oh, that's far too few. Uh, I mean, you're probably accustomed to asking agencies, just calling them up and being like, hey, like, I'm interested in this data set. Do you collect it? And if so, could I have it? Because you know, you're a public agency. Um, but you know, sometimes you're asking for data sets that they probably realize could look bad for them. And in that case, you have a way to demand it from them and have legal recourse, you know? Like basically demand it from them and, and, uh, and they are legally required to give it to you. But if you just call up on the phone and ask, they could say no and there's no penalty for them for doing that. But if you make a formal request via a, a Freedom of Information Act uh, request, they, they have to use one of seven very specific exemptions to that law to deny you. Otherwise, they're breaking the law. And they have to use the exemptions in a very narrow light. The exemptions are defined very closely. Um, and you know what we ended up doing was just like reading through the exemptions. And you can too. So I'm going to like use my favorite search engine, whatever is loaded here. And uh, so Illinois Freedom of Information Act. It's probably the second one. There you go. And like, it may look daunting. It's like a gray wall of text. That's what we call it in the journalism world, like where people get turned off because there's too much to read. But you guys are kind of like freedom of information nerds. Like that's why you're here. And you will understand most of this if you just read through it. And um, so if you're ever denied information, you can always read through this in like probably half an hour or less. And if they don't seem to be following those exemptions, like you know, if it seems like tenuous at best, uh, that their denial fits one of the seven exemptions, uh, you have legal rights. But you have to have like essentially emailed them and asked them under the act, which just means you say, hi, under the FOIA Act, I request this. That's all it is. It's very simple. Um, and this can help you. FOIA machine, it's a way for you to like catalog your, your requests. Obviously, if you're making just a couple, you don't really need this. But, um, but it saves your request, so you have proof that you sent it. Um, it has a database of like all most of the agencies and their FOIA contacts you know, the emails to which you send your requests. And, um, and it generates boilerplate for you. So like in case you're like, you have writer's block and you're like, oh no, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Like they'll, they'll fill in all this stuff. Like, all right, so here are my requests. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that, um, that I requested recently, um, does Chicago Public Schools teach a lot of computer science? I don't know. And I asked very specifically uh, about their computer science curriculum and their availability. And let's see, I asked this September 23rd. They've not gotten back with me. I work there. I'm trying to find out. It's really hard to find out. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Cool. So, um, so I work with this, with this lawyer, Matt Topic. He's like basically like the best FOIA lawyer out there as far as I'm concerned. I think there's probably someone who works with Jason Leopold out on the West Coast who's pretty good. But Matt's great. And he lives in Chicago. And he works for this firm, Lovey & Lovey. It's a civil rights firm. And the reason they took my case is because you know, they thought my case was like of civil rights import. You know? I thought so too. Um, but crucially, like, they only take cases they think they can win because um, oftentimes the people who work with them don't have any money to give them. And that was the case with me. Um, in this case, uh, you may be delighted to know Illinois law provides for attorney's fees if an attorney wins a FOIA case. That's because. Um, if you win a civil suit against the government for not following the FOIA law, 
that means the government acted improperly. So it stands to reason that like, you know, they'd provide attorney's fees. And, and it's a really cool law because um, it's self-selecting against frivolous suits. You know, if, if attorneys uh, are only going to get paid if they win, they're only going to take the cases they're pretty sure they can win. So um, I'm, I'm pushing, and, and the, uh, the um, Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, I'm working with them to push this kind of law nationally. Um, incidentally, I'm one of their like grantees uh, for a recent fundraising campaign. So if you want to give some money to the Freedom of the Press F Foundation, you can, and you can sort of like designate who it goes to, me or um, their general fund or, uh, or, you. or me. <laughs> no, but also, also um, another organization in Chicago, really crucial journalists, um, independent journalists at this organization, is called Invisible Institute. Uh, they've been around for a lot of years on the south side. Jamie Calvin. Jamie Calvin originally wrote the story that got me and my friend onto Laquan's case. You know, if it weren't for Calvin's work, like requesting the autopsy, for instance, uh, we never would have realized, gosh, this is like a really heinous case. Like, we've heard there's a video, like, it, the public deserves to see it because the, um, originally the police said, said that. Laquan lunged with a knife, and, and they said the officer shot one time, which was totally false. Both, both of those things was, was false. Um, and so Calvin's story in Slate in like February, about a year ago, I think, um, just sort of broke that wide open. But Calvin didn't request the video. He, um, like everyone else, believed that um, that when the government says, we've got an active investigation, we've got an ongoing investigation, <coughs> then they can, they can keep denying like the evidence that's part of that investigation. Well, um, we, we thought, especially if there's a video of what could be a terrible killing, <coughs> you know, extrajudicial killing, um, that specifically may not apply, you know, that, that a judge might find that that should not, um, that part of the, the exemption should not apply. Um, so yeah, we, we, we argued that, that, um, that one, they have to prove that inve an investigation is ongoing. That's key. And, um, and the fact is they do, you know, according to FOIA law and case law, they have to prove that they're investigating still, you know, and it was almost a year on. Like, Jesus, there's a video of the whole thing and you took a year to investigate it? Like, at any rate. Um, and then two, we, had, we, we, we said, you know, you guys have to prove that releasing the video would harm the investigation. And, you know, that's what we told the judge. You know, according to the law, this is what the city has to do. And the judge found in our favor in both, in both cases, you know. Um, so... If you're ever wondering, like, like hey, if, if law enforcement anywhere, or I guess a prosecutor's office too, um, says there's an ongoing investigation, particularly when it, when it involves a police officer, like you may now have rights. And you may have always had them, but now, now it's sort of well known. Like the public has the right to know this kind of stuff. Anyway, let me get on to more stuff. I mean, it's been a long time. I've been talking a lot. Muckrock is basically... Um, You've probably gone through this before, but it's, it's like FOIA machine, except um, they kind of have some artificial intelligence that generates replies to the government. So essentially, if you're using this, um, they charge a small fee, but um, you, computers follow up for you. When the government doesn't respond to your request, the muckrock computers basically like say, like, hey, you haven't responded to this. It's past the deadline, you know, the, the, it's beyond your time as outlined in your state law, which is really cool. Um, by the way, the deadline in Illinois is five business days, and they're technically allowed, if it's a, if it's a complicated enough request, they're allowed to take five more. So they've got two, two weeks. Um, and then after that, like, technically you have the right to uh, recourse, and the two, two methods of recourse are going to the attorney general's office and suing. Um, 14 other 
news organizations requested this video before I did. Um, two of us, or sorry, 10 news organizations divided among 14 requests. Some of them doubled. But of the 10 news organizations, um, myself and one other pushed back. I pushed back via the lawsuit, and the Wall Street Journal pushed back um, going to the Attorney General's office. They eventually got nowhere. Um, the AG said uh, the city should not have released, or sorry, th they said the city uh, should not have withheld the video. Uh, but it's a non-binding opinion, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> OK. Technically, I hear they could have gone uh, the route of a binding opinion, which may have like forced the city to release the video, but um, you know, apparently they didn't want to push too hard on Rom's government. I want to kind of wrap it up and take your questions. I, I should direct you to my friend, Freddy Martinez. Um, he's like a first-rate activist, and uh, uh, he was a, an astrophysicist for a while, and now he's like a privacy researcher. And he's been on this like stingray case, like, you know, like on it like Donkey Kong. I don't know what you say, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, just this week a judge uh, ruled in his favor and said the city has to turn over all kinds of documents related to cell phone surveillance that the police does, police do, uh, turn it over to the court so that judge, uh, judges or this judge in particular can review it all. So that's Freddy Martinez, and one of the things he and I have done, and I'll probably write about this soon, is um, we requested the database of Chicago Police FOIA responses. Um, basically, they create a database of like when the request is made, when it is fulfilled, if, if, if the government asks for more time, that sort of thing. And we basically... Uh, we found that like 30% of requests are late, uh, which is technically against the law. And, um, and we're trying to parse it to see like what kinds of requests are late. Um. Brandon, could you go back to October 2014 and just make sure that like we're all on the same page about what happened before you got involved? Yeah, um, I mean, Sorry to have assumed that you, you all knew the story, but um, you know this young man was um, shot by police uh, like in a around midnight uh, on a pretty big street. I think it was Pulaski. Um, shot out in the middle of the street, and um, and it was caught on dash cam video. And um, the worst part about it was that um, that all the news media reported the police line, which is that which was at the time that um, that the officer shot in self-defense and and um, etc. So so basically, uh, in March, you know, from October to March, there wasn't much activity except maybe Jamie Calvin was like pushing on it. Um, and then in March, my friend uh, Billy Joe Mills gets me in contact with an activist, and this activist is like so convinced. He's like, uh, his name's William Calloway. He's like really convinced that this needs to come out, this video, after reading Jamie's story. And so he's, he's like searching for someone to file a suit, and he didn't know how to do it, and my lawyer friend didn't know how to do it, but he knew I had done it before. Um, so. Long story short, um, I just know this guy via a group text for like four months. And uh, he's always texting me back. He's like, hey, how's the FOIA coming? How's the FOIA coming? Oh, the, they're two months late. Oh, they're three months late now. We can probably sue soon. And then like in the suit, like it takes a while. And this guy's like texting me like, like man, this is important. And I was like, yeah, I know it's important. But I didn't realize how important it was. You know, Will Calloway is like, you know, he's, a, he's on the ground. He's like a first-rate activist. Like, um, he knows the families of the people who are shot by police. Like, that's his thing. So, um, oh, in case you want to get in contact with me or, or him, uh, he's, he's at uh, Twitter Christianaire. 
Yeah, that's him. <laughs> it's funny. But uh, and and uh, that's like his organization, Christian Air. And I'm at Muck Rakery. And um, so I mean, this is kind of where I post like my thoughts or whatever. But uh, in case you want my cell phone number, I'll I'll give it to you right now. It's uh, 740-505-0038. Can you see that? And then um, if you have something sensitive to tell me, buy a disposable phone at CVS, you know. <laughs> Please and thank you. Um, you know, there are other ways that we're trying to, like, uh, get, you know, um, some functionality for, like, anonymous whistleblowing, the secure drop system we're trying to install. When I say we, it's like me and my, my buddies who are all, like, you know, we all have day jobs. Like, I write for The Guardian and Al Jazeera and The Reader and In These Times, but, but like, I don't, like, no one's hired me as, as a full-time journalist. So um, I manage an office. <laughs> and, uh, and, like, me and all, all my friends do this in our free time. <coughs> so I'm just like you, really. Um, you know, I read the news and I, like, think about this crap just like you. And... Um, by crap, I mean, like, when I get it on my head that, like, someone's doing something that they shouldn't be, you know. And, and then I just, like, file a bunch of FOIAs. Like, if you hear something, <coughs> file a FOIA or, or tell a journalist to file a FOIA. There are so many journalists on the Internet. Don't forget it. Write it down. Tell someone. Um, or tell me, please. Uh, Back, uh, sort of in the black jacket, real quick. Yeah. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. The first question is why the bomb was McDonald's? Like, why this case? And then my second question is how did they know that it was reported? Um, I mean, we, we, you don't need to know that it was recorded. Like, um, any, anything in, in which there were, like, police cars present? Like, the police car's dashboard cameras should be running, and, um, uh, you know, soon there may be body cams. So what the cool thing about FOIA is you can just ask, like, were there any running cameras on the scene that night? And if so, I want the videos. And if they say there were no running cameras, then, you know, there was so much reporting on Laquan McDonald, you know? Uh, like, and I didn't do most of it. I was just, like, a reader, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I probably, me and Will probably read that there were dash, dashboard cameras on the scene. Um, most likely, it was written because, like, you know, rep all the reporters requested it. And, and how, how Laquan McDonald as opposed to anyone else? Yeah. It was just sort of the first one that we, that we filed. There, you know, there are, like, I mean, one police shooting a week for the last 29 years in Chicago. Like, that's the stat. Um, and the Steve Bogira at the Chicago Reader reported extensively on this, like, less than a year ago, I think. Um, and, uh, n I mean, not all of them are fatal. Uh, in the past five years or so, I think there were, like, 400 or 450 police shootings, and 70 of those were fatal. Um, so, like, we could have requested this for any one of those 70. And we probably will soon. I kind of have a follow-up that I wasn't sure if you were going to answer or not, but if they had said there was no camera running, how would you have pushed back? Or like, can you? Well, yeah. Um, I, we would have asked for like reports, internal reports, I think, about like what the officers said happened. Um, and if they said there were cars on the scene, we would have then followed up with a FOIA request and said, like, all right, there were cars on the scene. Did the cars have cameras? And then if they said yes, you follow up. Were the cameras running? No. Why weren't the cameras running? You know? It, it might take a series of five FOIA requests, each of those taking a week or two, but, you know, you can get answers. That's the bottom line. Sorry? How long have police cars had cameras? That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to it. I mean, um, I'm going to like guess five years, maybe, uh, maybe 10 years. I, someone would know better than I. Carl, I think you had your hand up. 
Oh, in your experience as a journalist, my memory is that most of the cops uh, who were on the scene other than at night, they said, oh, I didn't see what happened. Like when they were giving their testimony to investigators, they said, oh, I didn't really see what happened. In your experience, is that equivalent to breaking the wall of silence? Are they basically saying, yeah, he shot him in cold blood? And like, would they have said something like, oh, no, he was lunching if they really were trying to do that? Quite possibly, and we will never know. You know, unless, unless one of those officers decides to, like, seriously, like, turn and tell their story to me or someone else, like, that, they'll take it to their grave, you know? Um, but I really think that we're living in, like, a golden age of journalism, you know, accountability journalism. Uh, and, like, like, I think the role of the whistleblower is, is um, you know, it's gaining traction. Maybe in part because, um, because we hear lots of claims of transparency, but like if you, if you talk to, to journalists, like they'll say, oh my gosh, no. No, the, like this administration is not transparent. Like they, 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 they're anything but. Like <clears throat> you guys probably remember three weeks ago, four weeks ago when uh, Rahm Emanuel gave this speech wherein he was crying literally while he was in the chamber giving that public speech crying his lawyers that presumably he's directing at the exact same time were in a courtroom across like a few blocks away arguing against the release of another video almost exactly like this so so for him to say man i want transparency you know, like, like you got to put your money where your mouth is, in my opinion. Maybe someone from the other side, and then I'll come, come back. Uh, in, the, in the back, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, when people talk about having familiarity and fluency with lawyer requests, and, you know, learning what the things you need to do to make them effective, uh, could you just speak to that a little bit? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I think my number one piece of advice for like filing FOIAs, like making an interesting FOIA request or a meaningful FOIA request, is um, <clears throat> think of something that it would be a big news story if the government denied you the information. Uh, you know, if, if the government said like, no, sorry, you can't have that for whatever excuse they give. You know, you could like take that and give it to a reporter at the reader, and they would write about it. There, there are plenty of things that you can ask about that fall into that category. You know, um, often what will happen is they'll give you back some stuff, and it won't be interesting. But sometimes they'll they'll give you back stuff that's like groundbreaking. You know, and and it's really a shot in the dark. Like what I'm trying to do here with all of you is like deputize you. You know, like, and me and Will, Will and I are going to go to uh, neighborhoods on the south and west sides, like, in the spring. I'm doing it, I'm doing one of these uh, on Saturday. Oh, this is also Will's GoFundMe. Um, if you want to, like, donate to activism more than journalism, Will's who you donate to. But, uh, but... Yeah, here, like Will and I are, oops. Will and I are hosting this like voter registration drive, like at you know, 50th in Michigan, I think, and um, and we're gonna give like a mini FOIA class because there's gonna be a lot of people there, and we're gonna give other FOIA classes too, and we're trying to like, basically like make sure that everyone in areas most affected by police. Uh, violence, know how to FOIA. <clears throat> and make no mistake, police violence occurs um, in very concentrated areas. You know, I live in Lakeview East, and police don't get violent with citizens there. They just don't. Um, you know, so that's kind of what we're fighting against, is sort of like this idea of unequal treatment, une unequal policing. Um, and 
and if any of you are interested in that and helping like disprove the notion that oh, some areas are just like tougher, you can disprove it. It's, it's, uh, there's data out there. We're, we're trying to find some data too, but we'd love your help. Um, let's see, what was I? <laughs> Jamie Calvin, by the way, Invisible Institute. Um, I was going to show you this. The Citizens Police Data Project. <clears throat> Calvin won a lawsuit that was a landmark suit, forced the city to, to uh, release, all, uh, I guess, all of its data about um, complaints against police. And um, by the way, it's very hard to complain against a police officer or to file a complaint. You might think like, oh, people like make frivolous complaints because they like have a grudge against this op op No, it's, <clears throat> it's really difficult because you have to like, one, an officer has to take a statement from you in person. And if, if, you've, been, if you've been wronged by a police officer, the last thing you want is to interact with a police officer. And two, you have to, a second step, you have to go to a particular place. I think it's police headquarters. There may be one other place you could go, but it's a particular place and it's a particular time during the month. It's like maybe a couple times a month for like two or three hour window. So like, you gotta take off work. It's a commitment to file a complaint against the police. So that's why the database of complaints, which is here, is so important. I mean, it, it's, it's important because it's accurate. It's accurate to demonstrate, you know, police wrongdoing. So anyway, they have, they, they have these heat maps, and man, you can parse all kinds of data. They, they, um, they did a great job here. Um, sorry, let's, let's go for more questions. Um, in the case of this, where the materials you're requesting are very, like, trash from a particular family, yeah. how do you kind of balance out what the family wants and what you think the public service should be on? Um, it's an incredibly tough question. <laughs> Um, it's tough for me to have empathy because I don't have a child. Um, and I've, I've had that question asked of me a lot <clears throat> in the past couple months, you know, because the initial word from Laquan's mother was that she would rather the video of his death not be plastered all over every internet tabloid. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's a hard situation. I, uh, I had an idea that reform, serious reform, could come from it. You know, it may have like harmed her and her family to see that out. But, you know, if we're talking ethics, you know, the greatest good for the greatest many or whatever, like, it could prevent dozens or hundreds of young boys just like her son from suffering the same fate. And like, I, I, I would love to have a conversation with her about it, you know? I wanna tell her story, but she doesn't wanna talk. Um, so for me, like, that, that was my thought process, but the bottom line is like, a judge found it to be unlawful that the video was withheld. So like, the law said the video should have been released, bottom line. And, and it was hard for me. It's hard for everyone to watch the video, you know? It's, it's hard for everyone to realize that, that police shoot a person a week. You know, and that it's never investigated. By the way, I wrote a column about this. It's not ever really investigated. Um, the Independent Police Review Authority, um, a whistleblower came out of that last summer. You know, he was fired. Uh, and he provided emails to reporters that showed he was asked to, to change his investigations. So, um, you know, like, I think like 1% of poli police misconduct cases result in discipline. Of the 400 shootings, two of them were disciplined in the past five years. 
So like, that kind of crap is hard to think about. It's depressing. You don't want to think about it. But like, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't think about it and work to change it. In the very back. Um, no, um, I've not had that occurrence. Um, they, frankly, like, I don't think they keep good records of what records are destroyed. So if they don't have it, I think they'll just tell me they don't have it. You know, the, the people who work in the FOIA offices, like, you know, um, they do what they can, but, like, they're swamped. So, um, especially now. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Like, you know, the city should like increase the budget of that office, essentially, so they're not so swamped. Yeah, um, to your point about the city hiring more FOIA people, what, what is kind of, if you extend this out with deputizing more people, how does that play out? Like, will they eventually, I mean, does the city just have to comply because? Because the law. The law has a time deadline. So I mean, like the city, like Freddie and I's work, like, you know, we're going to try to like find out exactly how often they're missing their deadline and write about it. And like, you know, there could be a class action lawsuit, you know, for all the people whose deadlines were missed. And, and that would force the city to like hire more people to do this work, you know? So eventually, like, because it is breaking the law, they'll somehow be forced to hire more people. Oh, but um, I realized the thing that I was going to say. Um, that's a great point about um, the longer than five years records being destroyed. Um, the city and, ja well, Jamie Calvin's lawsuit that, um, that released all this stuff, uh, he was fighting the city, right? The police department, the city. Now, Calvin and the city are on the same team fighting against the police union. Calvin and the city want to keep these records of police. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's technically police misconduct or if it's just the complaints against police. But at the very least, it's complaints. And um, the, the FOP, the, the police union here, wants uh, records that the city has. Uh, they've kept onto these since like 1967. So they have probably huge rooms full of filing cabinets of these complaints uh, from 67 to roughly 2010. Um, and, and, and the FOP wants them all to be destroyed. And uh, so there's this, you know, they're in court. And I don't know how it's going to go, out, go, go down because like, I hear that technically, technically the city signed this contract with the FOP that says complaints older than five years are to be destroyed. And, you know, they haven't been, so that's a good thing, even though it's sort of breaking the contract. But my question is, why in the world did the city sign the contract in the first place? I've yet to get to the bottom of that. If any of you have a, any tips, let me know. In the stripe, striped shirt? Uh, I know it's a huge problem in other countries, but do you hear a reprisal, or have you felt like, No, no. I mean, I think that they realize that it's just sort of, sorry? You mentioned the burner phone. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's to protect you, not to protect me. You know, like if you're going to give me some information from like within your job, and there are like, by the way, if there are five people who know the information you're giving me, think long and hard. Um, if there are 50 people who know the information you're going to give me, you're probably okay. You know, that's, that's the equation. But no, I haven't felt threatened at all because they, they have so many lawsuits against them all the time. And I, I just feel like um, they, they feel like it's gonna com coming home to roost, you know, like it's finally catching up to them. 
All right. Thanks, everyone.